you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And I came across this verse the other day in a devotional book, and it just stood out that these troubles we get are, they will happen, and we have to just accept them. And, you know, no matter what, we have a Lord that has overcome the world, and he will give us comfort and peace to go through life with these battles. And we just have to accept that these are normal, and we just can't let us can't let these battle ruin us instead we have to let them improve us and change kind of who we are so yeah let's pray god i thank you for this beautiful sunday morning and thank you for holding off the rain so we can be outside and worship you lord and i thank you that through all these battles we face in our lives that you are always there to comfort us lead us god i pray for the rest of the service and pray for brent as he brings brings us the message amen so I'll call praise team up to lead us in worship, and then Jenny Brenneman to lead in the children's feature. Good morning, everyone. We invite you to stand and uh, praise with us as you know the words, and no one can hear you all that well outside, so if you don't know the words, you just say la 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 <laughs> And then come in when you know them, loud and strong. He has made me glad. I will enter.
Psalm 147 says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. It also says, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant and praise is becoming. And in Psalm 1611, it says, in his presence is fullness of joy. If you have any age on you at all, you know that joy does not come from your experiences or your circumstances or um, what someone else does or says. Your joy comes uh, from God alone. And Psalm 16 says that in his presence is fullness of joy. Enter into his presence. Um, the men are going to take the lead on this song. I will call upon the Lord and the ladies will echo.
We can't, I can't hear you guys, but I'm <laughs> trusting you're belting. And the fun thing about being outside is that you can like super sing. So let's super sing this last one. Blessed be your name. be your name in the land that is plentiful where dreams of abundance flow blessed be your name your name. We sing so many wonderful things about you. We call you our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our forgiver, our redeemer, our way maker. We call you a miracle worker. We call you a promise keeper. And yet we struggle to believe it sometimes. So God, we invite you by your Holy Spirit to teach us. Open our hearts to receive what you have us for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, we're going to have a children's time. So if I could get some of my helpers over here to help me lay out some blankets, I'm going to invite you to come up. I don't really want to talk to like nobody, so I'd like to see your faces. Um, you can grab your mask if you want to, but we'll be socially distanced. I promise I'll make it worth your while if you come up. Maybe Curtis.
Chris and Reed, would you be able to spread one of these out? Look at this, all the children. It's wonderful. Here, a little bit. Do you want to spread this one out, Wyatt? And Sawyer, you're going to have to sit down quick because they're going to fly away. I see there's some straw on that one blanket. wonder where that came from. <laughs> okay, I'm going to sit over here. So good morning. It's good to see all your faces. So um, good morning, everyone. And talk to the camera too. Um, so, do you? Does anyone know who I am? So raise your hand if you like know my name. Good. Good. Uh, do you know anything else about me? Like, if someone were to point me out in a crowd and be like, "Who's that girl?" Would you have anything else to say, Ethan? You would. Oh, Ethan said he would say that I'm his mom. So that's good. So I'm Ethan's mom, I'm also Molly's mom and Haley's mom. Anything else that you know about me? Like, don't be shy, don't be mean, but don't be shy. I'm Brad's wife. I'm Mrs. Jenny Brenneman. <laughs> um, anything else that you know about me? I live on a farm, that's good. Reed, do you know what I do on the farm? I milk, I feed the calves. I'm a calf feeder. I don't milk cows very often, but I feed them and I feed the calves. And I see Nancy Entz over there and that reminds me, maybe she would say that I'm Shriveled's daughter. <laughs> My mom's nickname is Shriveled. Um, okay, so I, you know, you know things about me, which is, that's really cool. Um, if I was to ask you, who are you? So I know most of your names. I know all of your names actually. Uh, look at me bragging. <laughs> And you know what, I look at you and I can tell who your parents are because also because I know them, but also you sort of remind me of them. Like each of you, I can kind of like, yeah, you're a Gerber. I can tell that you're a Gerber, Wyatt and Sawyer. Um, so if someone were to ask you who you are, what kinds of things would you tell them? Just yell it out. Come on, grade six, seven and eights. We already did this. <laughs> who your parents are, what else? What else would you tell them? Your name, age, when your birthday is, what you like doing, yeah, what you're interested in. Uh, some people can probably tell um, by the kind of hat you wear, what sports team you like. Um, maybe, maybe you've talked to people and they know that you're into gymnastics or riding horses or um, into Tonka trucks or whatever it is. Um, so who would your parents say you are? Just think about that for a second. How would they describe you or your grandparents? Your grandparents would have only nice, wonderful things to say about you. Um, and what about your teachers? What do your teachers have to say about who you are? Maybe you got a report card to the end of school. Can you just cheer for the end of school, first of all? Um, you probably got a report card and your teachers had some things to say about you, what you're good at, what you need to work on, what your goal should be for the next year. Um, I actually found an old report card of mine from Milverton Public School. And uh, one of the things in there, it said, Jenny is very enthusiastic and an accountable student. Oh, that's good. I'm still pretty enthusiastic about most things, some things not so much. Um, one other thing that surprised me in my report card is it said that something along the lines that math, like I, I did well in math, I was excellent, which shocked me because I, I tell everyone I know that I'm not good at math. My brain does not work that way, but in grade four, my teacher said that I was, that that was something I was good at. So somewhere after grade four, I started to believe for whatever reason that I was not good at math, that that's just not who I am. And I believed it and I can remember being very stressed out in high school about how um, hard math was and how I just can't do it. My brain doesn't work that way. I don't know how to do math. And my brother who 
was very good at math would help me and there were tears and I just didn't like it. Um, so somewhere someone told me or somehow I started to believe that I wasn't good at math. Um, another thing I came across a yearbook, I don't know what grade I was in, I think grade six, and my favorite teacher, there's a helicopter behind me, do you hear that? Um, my favorite teacher wrote in it, to my favorite actress who will one day win an Academy Award. Well, I am no, like nowhere close to ever winning an Academy Award or being in a movie. Um, so that, I mean, at the time maybe was true because I was very animated and I was in like a tiny little skit at school and I really wanted to be in the operetta that MPS, Milverton Public School did. I was so looking forward to that and when the time came, I just was too nervous and the audition didn't go well and I didn't, so like I ruined my chances of becoming an Academy Award winner because I wasn't in the grade eight operetta. Um, but my point in all of this is to say that a lot of people have a lot of things to say about who we are. And maybe your coaches, your teachers, uh, your parents, grandparents, friends can say a lot about who you are. Um, you believe that, that um, you're good or bad at certain things. But what if I were to ask you, who does God think you are? What does God think about you? Um, so 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then John chapter 1 verse 12 says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be a child of God. So that is really cool, I think, to be known as a child of God. We are part of God's family. And when we do that, when we are part of God's family, we have an opportunity to reflect who God is to those around us. So just like a lot of you are reflecting who what family you belong to, um, by the way that you act, the way that you talk. Um, my kids often get told, you sound just like your mom. And, and I don't know if it's because they inherited it because I'm their mom or because we spend a lot of time together and they begin to imitate me, um, but they reflect who I am out in the world. And it's the same when we are children of God. We have an opportunity to f reflect who God is because we are part of God's family and we are God's children. And another really neat thing um, that I just, is just so awesome to me to think about is that God thinks about you. He loves you and he thinks about you. Um, I imagine that there's going to be some moms and dads in September who are sending their kids off to school for the first time to JK who are going to be thinking about their kids all day long, making sure that they're okay making sure they're learning, make sure they're, you know, making friends and having fun. Well, God thinks about you sort of the same way. His thoughts for you would outnumber the grains of sand. The Bible talks about that. Um, I just think that's so neat that the creator of the world, who created the trees and the birds and, and everything that we see around us, he thinks about you. He cares about you and he loves you very much. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. Um, it's in the Old Testament, and has anyone ever heard of the, the book Zephaniah? Yeah, okay, good. So it says that the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Oh, what a picture that is, that my Heavenly Father rejoices over me with singing. If you live in a family who likes to sing, you have probably um, know what it means to have your mom or your dad rejoice over you with singing. Maybe it, it's embarrassing, <laughs> but they love you and they're rejoicing over you. And God does the same thing. That's so exciting. And the Bible is full of these kinds of truths, these um, things that are true about who we are, who God is, and how much he loves us. So the Bible also talks that um, that God's rules or his ordinances are more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. And maybe that verse is going to come up again um, in the service. So I want you to just take a mental note of where that verse is found, where it talks about that God's ordin ordinances or his laws, his rules, are more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. And so when we read God's word, when we read the Bible and we we don't just quickly skim over it, but we really look at what those verses are saying. 
about who we are, who God sees us as, it can change our lives. It can change how we think about ourselves and how we are friends to those around us. Um, another verse that I like is in Psalms 34, 8. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So we need to kind of dig into God's word and really taste it, make it real. So rather than um, a tiny piece of candy like a rocket that you chew and swallow quick, you need to really taste God's word, more like gum, like chewing on God's word, savor it a little bit, really taste that, that God's word is good and um and that he loves you. And there are so many more truths like about who God says we are to him. We're a child of God, we're precious to him. He thinks about us. Um, so I want to encourage you this summer, you have an opportunity to really dig into God's word, to figure out um, who God says you are, to make it real in your hearts so that it changes you. Um, Jesus wants to meet you where you are and he wants to be your friend and he loves you so much. So to remind you to do that, I have um, some gum. Maybe, Haley, could you bring it over here? Um, some gum I'm gonna hand out to you, and that's to remind you that instead of like a rocket or a small piece of candy that you would chew quickly and kind of forget about, meditating and studying God's word and reading it should be like chewing gum, like savor it a little bit, let it sink in. So I'm gonna just pray for you, and then you can come and grab a piece of gum, or not just a piece, you get a whole pack. And then uh, you can go back to your parents. Okay, so let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much for these children. Um, I pray that you would be made real in their hearts and in their lives. I pray that they would know deep down in their knower that you are God and that you love them so much. I pray that that knowledge would change them from the inside out and that they could reflect your glory wherever they go. In Jesus' precious name, everyone said... You may grab a piece of gum and then head back to your parents. scripture reading today, it will be read from Psalms 19, 1 to 14. Psalms 19, 1 to 14. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of, sorry, the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes it circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The, statu the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your, then your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I now call up Brent for his message titled, In the Glory of God in Creation and Command.
Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Jenny, for that message, which was really for all of us. Um, and praise team for, for leading us in worship earlier. I am so glad to be able to preach this outside. Psalm 19 needs to be preached outside, I think. Facing a green field with a beautiful breeze, able to look up at the sky, even if it's covered with clouds. And I'm not sure if that rumbly sound is from the sound system, or is it thunder in the distance? I don't know. The sound system. OK, well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Now, of course, wherever you are, whether you're in the church building or connecting by phone or computer, you are still in God's good creation. The whole world is a theater of God's glory, John Calvin said. Psalm 19, of course, just puts it so, so brilliantly. that The heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they declare knowledge. They reveal knowledge. Well, what are they saying? How does creation speak of the Lord? What does it whisper? What knowledge has our creator implanted in this universe for us to discover? What does it tell us about him? And I confess, I don't ask this often enough. I'll easily drive past or walk past a, a fruitful garden or, or the winding Nith River without, without giving it a thought. Elizabeth Barrett Browning once wrote, Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush of fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries and daub their natural faces unaware. Open my eyes, Lord. What is creation's message? Here in, in, in Psalm 19, David focuses on the sky. There are other parts of creation you, you, we can easily focus on, but he focuses on the sky. What does it say about the Lord? Now, now, probably most obvious, it shows his creative power. A young boy wrote a, a letter to God. He said, Dear God, I didn't think that orange went with purple until I saw the sunset you made on Thursday. That was cool. Signed, Eugene. There's a masterpiece above us, painted by an awesome divine artist. It keeps changing. And of course, you know, with telescopes and, and space probes, we, we get to see far more of it, far closer than, than any generation in, in history. All this proclaims the greatness of God and calls us to praise him. In the book of Nehemiah, Israel's worship leaders rejoice in the Lord, saying, Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that's in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. So, so the skies announce God's creative power. But that's not all. In Genesis 49, Jacob assures his son Joseph that the Lord will show his care through the blessings of the skies above. In, in Deuteronomy 28, Moses in, encourages Israel to obey the Lord, promising that he will open up the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the works of your hand. There's blessing in the sky. It reveals the persistent goodness of the Lord. He's written his generosity into creation. When Jesus urges us to love our enemies in, in 
in Matthew 5, he calls us to imitate the, the, the kindness of our heavenly Father who causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Michael Card, a, a Christian musician, he once described a visit to China. And, and he, he said, again and again, I talked to people who had never heard of Jesus or, or a single word from the Bible, yet through nature and their God-given conscience, many believed in God. He said, many, not only did they believe God existed, they had derived some understanding about his loving character because he provided food, water, and a beautiful world. He said, one old woman told me, I've known him for years, I, I just didn't know his name. And so the skies, they speak of the Lord's creative power and his persistent goodness. But there's more. They also reveal his judgment on a world in rebellion against him. In Noah's time, how did the Lord declare his no to the evil in this world? He unleashed a flood from the sky. In Deuteronomy 11, Moses warns that if his people turn from the Lord and worship idols, he will shut up the heavens so it will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce, and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord has given you. Well, does that mean that every dry spell or, or flood is, is a, a judgment from God on, on specific sins? No. No, but the world... The world as a whole is in bondage to decay. Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans 8. It, it reflects the goodness of God, but it's also broken. It's home to viruses, earthquakes, droughts. One couple told their young son about the wonderful things God had made. Who made the sun, they asked him. God, who made the rain? God. One day, Mom looked at the toys scattered on the floor and asked, Who made this mess? The boy answered, God. Well, God's in charge, but we are responsible for the mess. <laughs> whether, whether it's disease, a violent storm, or, or, or a tragic accident, these things that, that cause suffering, they remind us that the earth is groaning for redemption. That, that it's not all as it should be, that it's still waiting to be, become all God intends it to be. And that, that we too are not yet all God intends us to be, even while we are deeply loved, even as we find our identity in him. We need Jesus. So the heavens above not only testify to the Lord's creative power, to his persistent goodness, and to judge, judgment, his judgment on sin, but, but they also speak of his faithfulness. 3,000 years after the psalmist wrote, after, day, after Psalm 19 was written, we can gaze up into the same sky, thousands and thousands of kilometers from where he did, but we can look up into the same sky with the same sun, the same stars, the same kind of clouds. The Lord keeps on holding this universe together. Psalm 119 testifies, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You established the earth and it endures. That's Psalm 119, verses 89 to 90. The, the explorer Richard, Richard Byrd spent six months alone in Antarctica. He often looked up, fascinated, filled with wonder at the incredible sky. He says, the conviction came to me that the rhythm was too orderly, too harmonious, Sorry about this wind in my notes here. 
but I, I didn't memorize Richard Byrd's quote. He said, the conviction came to me that the rhythm was too orderly, too harmonious, too perfect to be a product of blind chance. That therefore there must be purpose in the whole. And that man was part of that whole and not an accidental offshoot. God, God sustains life on this planet day after day. Every time we see a sunrise, it reminds us his creation is speaking of his enduring faithfulness. Even so, this, this universe, as amazing, vast, good, and stable as it is, it's still only temporary. In Isaiah 51, verse 4, the Lord says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. So the creative power, the persistent goodness, the truthful judgment, and the enduring faithfulness of the Lord far exceed what we see in creation. He's not bound by, by space or time. This earth and sky will pass away, but from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. For now, the universe declares his glory, night and day. But, but you need to listen closely, because the psalm says, the heavens have no speech. They, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. How is this? They, they speak, but with no words. Well, it's, it's a nonverbal message, isn't it? We human beings have trouble catching it because we, we're naturally alienated from God. We're created in his image. We're designed for relationship, for close communion with him. When Adam and Eve turned from the Lord, though, they, they broke something precious. And so, and so we've lost, to some extent, we've lost our ability to read the heavens well. We have trouble understanding the language of creation. Often we miss it or, or misinterpret it. How many of us through the ages have, have enjoyed the sights, the smells, the sounds of nature without noticing the fingerprints of our creator? Or worse, worship creation itself. You know, Israel's ancient neighbors, they weren't just captivated by objects in the sky. They saw them as gods. The sun was the god of justice, they said. A, a Sumerian hymn, um, pictured him as a, the son, as a hero who goes out. The Akkadians called him a bridegroom. Another son calls the sun god a warrior who goes into his bedroom with his wife. Well, Psalm 19 is aware, <laughs> aware of the stories that Israel's neighbors tell, but it sets the record straight, saying, in the heavens, God pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. It's God who alone is sovereign. He created the sun and everything else in the sky. He brought it all into being by his good pleasure. The sun is his servant. When it sheds light and heat on the earth, it brings glory to him. Creation speaks, but, but it needs interpretation. The skies reflect the holiness, the, the majesty, and the greatness of God, but they leave big questions unanswered. Would such a magnificent God have any interest 
and a small speck of dust like me? Could I get to know him? How would I ever make contact? We need help. We need words. We're, we're like builders studying a blueprint without knowing how to read it. We can puzzle out a few things. So if I were to look at a building plan for a skyscraper, I might be able to figure out how many floors and rooms it should have, maybe. But there'd be a whole lot of details that would be fuzzy for me. I'd need someone to interpret it for me. That's what God does in the Bible. That's part of what he does. He speaks to us. He reveals his heart and his will to us like a master architect explaining a blueprint in words that we can understand. The more we listen, the better we can see creation. We can look at what there is around us. We can see it with clearer eyes. Notice how verses 7 to 11 celebrate this gift. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Have you experienced that? Now, this this is his Torah. Not just the legal bits of the Bible, but the whole teaching of the Lord. All of his instruction for living well, that is the law of God. Six times in three verses, the psalm uses the personal name that God revealed to Israel, Yahweh, translated as the Lord. All, most translations have it all in capital letters. He's not distant but near. He's speaking to his people. His words are, are powerful and they're flawless. The Lord restores us. He calls us to repent of our sins and turn to him. He speaks to revive us. Have you experienced that? Hearing God speaking to the depth of your soul and being revived, coming alive. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. His directions are fully reliable. The Hebrew for statute includes the idea of testimony and warning, like a highway sign telling you that there's a bridge out ahead. God instructs us to give us wisdom. The the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. They're like a map showing you how to get somewhere you've never been before. The Lord's ways are are straight, true, and good. If you're not on his road, his directions might seem like drudgery. But when you are with him, when you know him, they are a delight. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. They pierce the darkness. With his truth, we can see. Our, Our vision becomes crisp and clear. We can step securely. Now, and, and also, you know, to have light in our eyes, it also speaks of being refreshed. Our, our, our faces is brighten as we gain strength. There's a, a story in, is it 2 Samuel? Um, where, where Jonathan is, is out um, on a day, um, it's a battle day, he finds some honey, he takes some, and and the Bible says his eyes brightened. Right? He, he got this energy, this this f- uh, fresh um, fresh wind. The commands of the Lord do that for us. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is pure. As when we hear Him speak, really hear Him, His word changes us. As, as we embrace it, we're humbled. We become awestruck before the Lord. His Holy Spirit works in us to cleanse us and to purify us. Not just now, not just in the moment, but for eternity. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. 
There's nothing wishy-washy or uncertain about the judgments of the Lord. Every judgment he makes, every pronouncement is solid. It's reliable. It's right. Now, David, in, in each of the lines here, he uses these terms that essentially mean the same thing, the Torah, the statutes, the precepts, the commands, the decrees of the Lord, the words of God for his people. They're more precious in gold than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from a honeycomb. Do you know and have you experienced what a priceless treasure this is? God, who spoke this universe into being, he also speaks to you and to me in words we can understand, not in code, but plainly. Do you crave his word? Do you long to hear from him? to receive his direction. It's so easy to take them for granted, isn't it? <laughs> By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. You know, we could pick out so many examples of how specific directions of the Lord both warn but also offer a reward. So you shall not commit adultery, the Lord says. Well, why? He wants to protect us from harm, from the wounds that come when someone has sex outside marriage. But, but it's far more than that. His, his warning springs from an incredibly positive vision for us. God created us with the capacity for sexual intimacy. When we reserve that for marriage, as God intends, we reap the benefits individually, as families and as as a community. Warning and reward are two sides of the same coin. You, you can look at any of his commands in the Bible, from, from respecting the elderly to loving foreigners to being generous to the poor. There, there are painful consequences when we ignore them, but there is incredible reward in keeping them. Yet who can discern their own errors? The psalmist asked. Who can discern their own errors? It's a rhetorical question. The, the answer, of course, is no one. My sin runs deep. I know some of my sin, of course. More and more, though, I realize that I'm not sharp enough, smart enough, pure enough to see and understand all of my faults and errors. Sin is embedded in my thoughts and habits. My best intentions are corrupted. Even when I think I'm doing good, I can hurt others, <laughs> sometimes without realizing it. Why am I driven to try to prove myself right? Why do I seek attention and respect? Why am I spiritually lazy? Why do I sometimes harden my heart toward others? What about you? Is it unsettling for you to think that you have flaws and sins that you know nothing about? Others around you might have some clues. That's part of the pain around this. Others can sometimes see that. But even they, they cannot see see us fully. Only God. Only God can fully discern and know our faults and errors. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, the prophet confesses, all of us have become like one who's unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. <laughs> the best stuff we think we're doing, that's filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like, our, like the wind, our sin sweeps us away. Do you believe that? Not only that you sometimes sin, but that you are so corrupted that even your noble, most well-intentioned acts are nothing to boast about. The, the Bible doesn't 
tell us this. God does not point this out in order to push us down, but to set us free. Forgive my hidden faults, David prays. This isn't sin that he's trying to hide or cover up, but faults that he doesn't even know he has. He wants nothing, absolutely nothing, to stand between himself and the Lord. Declare me innocent, he begs. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses the word justification to talk about this. Us being made right with God, declared innocent. Not because of anything in ourselves, but because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Declare me innocent, he begs. What about you? Do you pray like this? Again, the purpose of this biblical teaching is not that we would be down on ourselves, but that we would be clear-eyed. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. These are deliberate, eyes-wide-open sins. You know it's wrong, but you do it anyway. David knows the power of sin to rule him. It is our ruthless taskmaster. Even if we think we're in control, we are really in bondage. And so, desperately, David prays. He wants the Lord to rule his life, not sin. Is that your heart cry, too? I think Psalm 119 really lays bare the, the, the genuine battle this is. It's not something that we can just kind of take for granted and say, oh, I don't need to worry about that. But he prays, and he, he recognizes that as the Lord answers his prayer, as he's kept from these willful sins that they're not ruling over him, he says, then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. He knows he's capable of anything. <laughs> Do you? The Bible is the written word of God. So powerful. And yet it's dead to us when we are ruled by sin. The purpose of the Bible isn't mainly to impart information, but that we might come to know and trust and obey its author. In John 5, Jesus told the religious leaders, he said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. In the written word of God, we meet Jesus, the living word of God made flesh. Only he can break the power of sin and open our eyes to the glory of God in creation and to be able to see and appreciate his glory in his, the commands that he gives as well, the direction he gives. In Romans 7, Paul admits, although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And of course, <laughs> he rejoices. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus shows us our creator's face. He brings his glory near. And as we get close to Jesus, we see our own sin that much clearer. And then we discover that he doesn't condemn us. But on the cross, he carries our sin, our unknown errors, our hidden faults, our willful sins, and our great transgressions. He carries them. He conquers them. And he conquers death. So today, 
as we kneel before him, as we bow in our spirits before him, surrendering to him. He is risen from the dead. As we're honest about our sins, as we repent, as we reject them, and trust in Christ, he declares us innocent, blameless. And he gives us power. He breaks the hold of sin over us and enables us to live free and truly alive. Even so, we're, we, we're to live, and you know, the Apostle Paul really models this, with such radical humility because our experience and victory over this is a, a continual battle. But he fills us with the Holy Spirit so that when we open the Bible or even when we walk in his creation, we can hear his voice. We can hear the author's voice. The Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky said, we've never truly breathed air or s nor seen light until we have breathed in the God-inspired Bible and see the world in the Bible's light. Jesus makes that possible. He has come to renew the whole creation and make it sing with the voice it received in the beginning. And he renews you and me. And one day, one day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth that he's prepared for us. The more we come to know him, the better we can hear the silent message of the skies. What's he saying to you today? May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Father, thank you Thank you for the testimony of Psalm 19, for, um, for the way it, it, it points us to your glory and creation and the treasure of your word. Lord, thank you, too, for David's honesty about his own sin and, and um, for how he models, models that, um, that humble posture before you. Lord, we pray that, that, that you would enable us um, to not take for granted our need for your grace day by day, to not arrogantly assume that, that, uh, that we're right, or that we're, our motives are pure, <laughs> that we don't need you to continually purify us, take charge of us, Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, if any of us are uncertain here about where we stand in our relationship with you, I ask that, that you would, um, would especially, um, especially enable that person, those persons, to hear the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for my sins, that he carried them on the cross. I can live free. That I can walk closely with God. That eternal life is mine, that I'm a precious son or daughter adopted into his family through his blood. I ask, Lord, that, that for each of us, that, that, you would, um, that you would bring each one into a saving relationship with Jesus, and that you would help each of us to mature more and more as his disciples, that we truly would be able to rely on you and see your goodness and glory around us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.